the superior trunk block is a technique I described in 2014 as a refinement of an alternative to the interscalene brachial plexus block. It is a regional anesthesia technique that can be used whenever anesthesia or analgesia of the shoulder is required and is what I personally use instead of the conventional interscalene block. The superior trunk is formed by the union of the C5 and C6 nerve roots and it therefore produces the same clinical effect that the interscalene block does. Instead of targeting the brachial plexus at the level of the C5 and 6 roots, we are imaging it more distally where the roots have coalesced into the superior trunk. There are several advantages to this approach, which will be discussed later. This next section describes how to perform the superior trunk block. The scanning phase of the block is very similar to that of the interscaling block. I prefer to always start in the supraclavicular fossa to find the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus lying lateral to it. Sweep the probe up in a cranial direction to identify the separation into C5 and C6 roots. Slide the probe cordially to observe their union into the superior trunk. It is important to identify the suprascapular nerve which is always the most lateral and superficial little bubble of the superior trunk. Insert the needle lateral to the supraclavicular nerves and the lateral border of middle scalene muscle and advance to pierce the deep cervical fascia. A steeper angle facilitates puncture through this tough layer. Aim away from the plexus to avoid inadvertent transfiction. Once through, withdraw slightly and gently place the needle tip next to the plexus. Injection here should surround the superior trunk without much need for repositioning. I generally try to minimize needle nerve contact as much as possible. Ten to fifteen milliliters of local anesthetic is sufficient for clinical anesthesia or analgesia. The supraclavicular nerves that innervate the skin over the cape of the shoulder can be easily anesthetized by injecting 5 milliliters of local anesthetic into the superficial tissues over the middle scalene muscle. A word about the supraclavicular nerves. These are the lower branches of the superficial cervical plexus, which emerge from under the lateral border of sternocleidomastoid muscle and travel in an oblique direction over the middle scalene muscle. They divide into medial, intermediate, and lateral branches that innervate the clavicle and cutaneous area of the cape of the shoulder. The advantage of targeting these nerves instead of doing a superficial cervical plexus block is that you avoid blocking the auricular and mandibular branches and the patient will not have a numb jaw and ear. At the level of the C5 and C6 roots, they initially lie between the superficial and deep cervical fascia. Lower down, they ascend through the superficial cervical fascia into a subcutaneous location as they divide and they can sometimes be difficult to see. Nevertheless, they are readily blocked by infiltrating local anesthetic in the superficial tissues over the middle scalene muscle. The following are some clinical pearls for performing the superior trunk block. Remember that all nerves exhibit anisotropy, so as the probe is slid up and down the neck, adjust the probe tilt as needed to find the optimal degree of tilt that most clearly shows the boundaries of the superior trunk. It is essential to look for arteries which travel in a transverse direction over or through the brachial plexus. These include the transverse cervical artery, which usually crosses superficial to the brachial plexus, and the suprascapular artery, which can sometimes pass through the plexus. They are usually easily avoided by choosing a different transverse imaging plane and do not necessarily represent a contraindication to the superior trunk block. What is important to be aware 
of is where they are, particularly if you're struggling to align your needle with the beam during in-plane needle insertion. In this example, we identify the transverse cervical artery, we shift our probe so that the artery is no longer in view and thus not lying in the path of the needle. When inserting the needle, take care to maintain good alignment and needle tip tracking and remain aware of where the artery is, either more cranial or cordate, in relation to your probe position and your needle position. It is also good practice to look for the long thoracic and dorsal scapular nerves which run through the middle scalene muscle and can be at risk of needle trauma. They can be easily avoided in the superior trunk block, which does not require needle passage through the muscle. The needle tip should always be advanced in a plane superficial to the muscle and just under the deep cervical fascia. When piercing the fascia around any nerve, careful needle handling is paramount. Note how in, in this example, the needle is threatening to glance off the deep cervical fascia and slide into the superior trunk. Using a steep needle trajectory makes piercing the fascia much easier. Aim away from the superior trunk to avoid inadvertently traumatizing it with an uncontrolled pop through. And once through the fascia, use hydrodissection to open up the paraneural space around the superior trunk. In a randomized controlled trial by Kim and colleagues, they describe a superior trunk block technique that involved injection of 10 milliliters of local anesthetic below the trunk and then repositioning the needle to inject 5 milliliters above the trunk. Is this dual injection strictly necessary? In my experience, not if it, you're performing an analgesic block. As long as local anesthetic surrounds part of the trunk, adequate diffusion will occur. If performing a block for surgical anesthesia, it is probably prudent to try and surround the trunk. It may result in a faster onset of block. Is it therefore the ideal pattern of injection? Maybe, but I personally would not engage in aggressive needling that risks neural trauma to achieve this. If only injecting on one side, should this then be above or below the plexus? It's hard to say for sure, but in my experience, it does not seem to matter for analgesia in routine cases. There may be some operations where ensuring spread to the C7 root is important, and here injection between the superior trunk and C7 root or middle trunk may be preferable. This next section deals with the rationale for performing a superior trunk block instead of a conventional interscaling block. The original landmark guided interscaling block used the interscaling groove as a chief landmark, hence the name. The needle was advanced towards the transverse processes to contact the C5 and C6 roots. And when ultrasound was introduced, we realized we could visualize the C5 and C6 roots in the groove instead of blindly aiming for them, and so this became the default view and approach. The description of this technique was gradually refined as we realized that the C6 root often splits into two hypoechoic elements, and that anatomical anomalies of the C5 root were quite common, with C5 traveling outside of the interscaling groove through or over the anterior scalene muscle, and that the epineurium of the C5 and C6 roots was thin and poorly defined. This increased the risk of inadvertent intraneural injection with needle insertion between the roots, especially as visualization is not always optimal. This led to the recommendation of an extrafascial injection rather than an intrafascial injection technique. This video of an interscaling block illustrates how difficult it can be sometimes to get a good image of the roots in the interscaling groove, making it difficult to be sure that the needle tip is not subepineural and that we are not inadvertently injecting intraneurally. 
the C3, 4, and 5 roots give rise to the phrenic nerve, and the nerve itself lies on the anterior scalene muscle in close proximity to the C5 and C6 roots. Hemidiaphragmatic paresis therefore almost always results from interscalene block and should be expected when making a clinical decision to perform this. The superior trunk block addresses many of these pitfalls. First, the C5 and C6 roots always coalesce into the superior trunk, regardless of any anatomical anomaly in the course of the roots. In this individual with a C5 root traveling on top of and through the anterior scalene muscle, the superior trunk is easily visible in its usual location more distally. The superior trunk is also a consistently more visible target. It has gathered more connective tissue around it, so it has clearer hyperechoic margins compared to the roots. In this video, tracing up from the supraclavicular area, the superior trunk is clearly identifiable. But once in the interscalene area, the roots are very hard to distinguish from the surrounding muscles and tissues. The connective tissue around the superior trunk should also make it more resilient to needle nerve contact, which may reduce the risk of mechanical nerve injury. Unlike in the intrafascial approach to the conventional interscalene block, this paraneural sheath around the superior trunk does not have to be breached or entered to perform the block. All of this translates into ease of performance. A very important advantage of the superior trunk block is that the C3 to C5 roots and the phrenic nerve are significantly further away from the site of injection. This video shows how the phrenic nerve slides medially away from the plexus over anterior scalene muscle as we descend to the superior trunk level. The superior trunk block thus reduces the risk of hemidiaphragmatic paresis without compromising analgesic efficacy compared to the interscalene block. Two randomized controlled trials have been published that compare the superior trunk block and conventional interscalene block, both with 15 milliliters of local anesthetic. The results are remarkably similar. Complete hemidiaphragmatic paresis was seen in 72% of patients who received an interscalene block, with 100% of patients having partial or complete paresis, compared to only 5% of patients having complete hemidiaphragmatic paresis after a superior trunk block. The superior trunk block can also be used in a continuous catheter technique. Here, a catheter over needle set is advanced in exactly the same approach as a single shot block. We start more laterally so that the insertion site is well away from the surgical field. Local anesthetic is then injected in the usual manner to hydrodissect the space around the superior trunk to allow the needle to be advanced safely. In this particular case, the needle is aimed to pass below the superior trunk. The inner stylet is exchanged for the catheter. The catheter tip is then confirmed with hydrolocation to be lying just under the superior trunk. What follows are some additional examples of superior trunk blocks to further illustrate the concepts that have been described. In this patient, as we trace the plexus up from the supraclavicular area, a suprascapular artery is noted dividing the plexus. Further up, a transverse cervical artery is also noted superficial to the plexus 
but is not a significant obstacle in this case. The plexus is traced up to C5 and C6 and back down again to identify the optimal plane for needle insertion. Given the presence of the two arteries, the optimal plane is quite distal and is similar to that of the supraclavicular brachial plexus. At this level, it is important to confirm that the suprascapular nerve has not separated from the superior trunk. Adjust the needle approach as needed to pierce the cervical fascia without trauma to the underlying plexus. Once under the fascia, use hydrodissection to open up the space around the trunk. Note that spread can be obtained by appropriately directing the fluid jet without touching the trunk with the needle. In this example, we provide spread over the surface of the superior trunk by placing the needle just under the fascia and using hydrodissection. Finish the block with the usual injection around supraclavicular nerves. Post-block survey scan is always useful for assessing final spread and helps with future pattern recognition. In this example, the scan is starting at the proximal superior trunk and is traced distally. The supraclavicular nerves are unusually visible in this case, whereas the superior trunk is not, and this is due to anisotropy. The needle is inserted lateral to the supraclavicular nerves and advanced under them. The deep cervical fascia is pierced with an appropriately steep angle, once again aiming away from the plexus. Once through the plexus, the tip is positioned next to the suprascapular nerve and 15 milliliters of local anesthetic is injected. Five milliliters is injected around the supraclavicular nerves as the needle is withdrawn. This final example shows the C5 and C6 roots coalescing into the superior trunk. As in previous examples, the needle is inserted under the deep cervical fascia and injection next to the superior trunk produces appropriate spread around it.